five this evening. I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. It's uh, it's good. Most all of y'all are familiar to me. I'm Mayor Roy West. I have the privilege of being the current mayor of Beaumont, Texas. And this is an exciting evening. Our, our, our city council has been working hard, but uh, and we have passed some recent ordinances and uh, began to proceed on some things, Beaumont Vision 2035. But as most people know, you may see us on Tuesdays and you may see us on, on the news, but these people up here on the stage and several that are out there are the ones, I see our city manager sitting right there. They're the ones that execute every day. Kenneth, stand up. I didn't know you would be here. Kenneth Williams, our city manager right there. And uh, Kenneth Brigad, I see you. I mean, this it, it is our city staff that executes. And, and Cheryl, I don't mean to overlook anybody. Councilman Felshaw is back there. See, when you start this, Chief White, Chief Ockenichek, uh, I'll be here 30 minutes just doing introductions. But I just want to thank y'all for coming. This is an exciting time for our city. And you're going to be getting all the information from all the experts at this point. And with that, I, we're going to begin with a Pledge of Allegiance. And then I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to Denny Eman. So if you would please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for our all. Amen. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Downtown Focus Vision and Growth Community Forum. Uh, we're thrilled to have you guys here join us this evening as we explore the exciting future of our downtown. Uh, the forum will begin with some presentations on key topics, starting with the 2035 vision uh, for downtown Beaumont, followed by updates to Riverfront Park, the hotel RFP, the financial uh, framework for bringing these visions to life. We're also going to cover some code sweep initiatives um, and the newly implemented vacant building registry along with a range of economic development incentives. Um, and that's, that's available uh, to spur the growth. And after those presentations, we're going to uh, break out into some sessions where we can have some one-on-one -on -one discussions. You guys can ask me questions, comments, concerns, um, anything that you guys would like. We're so excited for you guys to be here. Uh, and at this time, I would like to introduce uh, Chris Boone, the Assistant City Manager, to take us into the first key topic. All right, thank you, Demi. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am excited to present to probably some of y'all for the first time the downtown, Beaumont Downtown Vision 2035 plan. Um, but before I do, I think in order to make a good plan, you kind of have to know how you got to this point. And many of y'all in this room have kind of lived some of this, but maybe not all of it. So I just want to go over sort of briefly, um, kind of how we got to this point as we look to the next phase of downtown redevelopment. Because again, as we sit in this building this evening, if you look behind us, this was a very bold, bold planning and execution of a very bold plan, right? So as you sit and you look at the vision behind you, the vision of the lake, the vision of the skyline. Um, it's a very important building that means a lot of people to, not just people in Beaumont, but people across the region. This is the preeminent uh, event facility in our region, I do believe. And so, again, bold vision. So as we talk, go tonight, talk through uh, tonight, we're talking about bold vision. This is one example of that. So, but again, before I jump into what the Beaumont Vision 2035 plan is, again, I really want to briefly, and they told me I had to go fast because I've got a lot of slides, um, but go over quickly how we got to this point. So, brief history of Beaumont. Beaumont, downtown Beaumont, believe it or not, uh, used to be not just the center for this region's government, courts, law, which it still is to this day, um, but it used to really be the center for this region's commerce on the riverfront. 
Uh, it used to be the cities, really the hub of the cities, uh, living. Many of our churches were located here. Many people did most of their shopping here. Um, and so this was the hub of really this region. Uh, and again, we're looking about going back about you know, really 125 years now. So fast forward from that time period to the decades of the 1950s, 1970s. Now, Beaumont was not unique in this situation. This phenomenon happened across the United States, especially where many cities, essentially many folks moved out of, whether it was living or shopping or um, a lot of activities moved out of their downtowns. And this was initially made possible by things like uh, streetcars, uh, but especially post-World War II, the automobile. And so with that, here's a, show, here's a photo of the Gateway Shopping Center, which is still with us today. That was one of Beaumont's earlier uh, shopping centers where, again, you could drive right up to the front door. You didn't have to look for a parking space. You didn't have to you know, schlep your po uh, packages from store to car. And so it offered a lot of conveniences that a lot of folks were looking, looking for. This is Parkdale Mall, 1973, again, extending that trend. And this is just not in Beaumont, but some track houses. So again, what we saw in Beaumont, which again is happening all over the country, especially post-war, World War II, was what we call suburbanization. And so this is a, basically the developed area of Beaumont in 1938, showing about 38 square feet, looking forward to 2016, and this is about 85 excuse me, square miles. So it, it basically doubled in this amount of time in terms of development. So what did that mean for downtown? Well, this is in the context of population staying fairly flat. So what did that mean for downtown? Again, Beaumont's not alone in this, but downtowns across the country, uh, you know, especially the shops, the clothing stores, the furniture stores, they really kind of panicked because all the shopping was going out into the suburbs. And so, a lot of shops started doing bizarre things, which is they would take their beautiful architectural facades and start covering them up with sheet aluminum. And you say, well, why would they do that? Well, the reason is they were trying to stay with the fashion. So people were shopping in new, uh, you know, out in the suburbs. And so whether it was furniture, fashion especially, you had to stay relevant. What else happened? Again. One of the things shopping centers offered was parking close to your shop. What this is, is a fire sandborn map. Uh, on the left, this is downtown Beaumont, 1941. Those pink squares, those are buildings. So you can see where it was a building from property line to property line, solid. Now fast forward to 2016, where those pink, dark pink buildings are gone, those buildings are gone. So what happened was, is those historic buildings over time Slowly, as businesses moved out, they were demolished. This is a map showing surface parking in downtown Beaumont. So you get an idea of what used to be predominantly buildings is now surface parking. And again, we're going to talk later tonight about a vacant building registry ordinance. And we're going to talk about code enforcement. And the reason I'm showing this is, again, how do we get here and how do we help preserve our future to try to preserve as many historic buildings as possible because we have lost so much. So fast forward to go on through the 1960s and 2000s. Again, just as downtown business owners panicked and started to do interesting things and tear down buildings to make parking lots, the city leaders also kind of panicked. In other words, the, what cities were was changing. And so how, do we, how does a downtown remain relevant? How do we reinvent ourselves? So looking back to the 1960s, the city leaders came up with a plan that just like this building we're sitting in here tonight and the lake, it was a bold vision. And that was we're going to reclaim our riverfront. Prior to this, it was very industrial. Um, years of timber industry, port industry, uh, you really couldn't get to it very well. And so what the city leaders did is came up with a plan in the 1970s 
and said, we're going to make downtown Beaumont the center for civic buildings and parks. We're going to give our citizens access back to the river in the form of a riverfront park. Uh, we're going to have a civic center, a city hall, uh, a library. We're going to use our historic buildings like our old city hall and theater and revitalize those. We're also going to partner and, and do a, you know, really a regional art museum. So again, how do we reinvent ourselves, look to the future? We're going to become a, really a destination for the re region. And again, we're still benefiting from that bold plan and those bold actions that took place really 40, 50 years ago now. We're still benefiting from that vision. Over the course of the years, we had some other plans in 1985, 1987. Um, but again, a lot of those visions never really materialized. Uh, meanwhile, again, in partnership with our private property owners, because again, this is a partnership between the public sector as well as the private sector. Over the, over the same timeline, you had the redevelopment of buildings like the Stead, the Hotel Beaumont. So that's part of the equation. Beaumont 20, uh, let's look at the decades 2000s to 20, 2010. Again, that trend continued. We have Cathedral Square Residential uh, just down the road, Sugar's redevelopment, and of course Crockett Street redevelopment. So again, during these decades, what did the city do? We focused on infrastructure. Again, if it's a partnership between the public sector and the private sector. So we invested in that time in streets, sidewalks, water, sewer, storm drainage. So real quickly, this is Main Street. You may forget, but the city came in and replaced aging streets, aging water and sewer, put in brick-lined streets, uh, planted street trees. This is a street view image of the street just behind this building. So if you look, that's what this looked like, uh, you know, going back 15 years ago. This is what it looks like now. Calder, the gateway to downtown. Again, we partnered with FEMA to do a drainage project, but also we did a streetscape project. This is what Calder looked like in the 1920s. This is what it looked like in 2006. Again, we partnered with FEMA, we did a streetscape. Again, this is a gateway to downtown. Now, fast forward to 2008. Again, trying to take a develop a bold plan, take bold action to help redevelop our downtown. So again, what we did is we knew we had, we knew we had to replace the Harvest Club building. And so the plan was to do that where we were sitting here tonight. So again, bold vision, bold plan, bold action. This is an aerial view of where you're sitting tonight. As you can see, it was vacant. There were burned out houses, burned out cars. Uh, it was pretty rough. This is the overview of where we're sitting tonight. This is Crockett Street right out here. That's what it looked like in 20, uh, 2006. That's what it looks like now. So, fast forward 2010 to 2020. Uh, the city expanded on that vision and we uh, developed a skate park which is used, I think, about 24 hours a day. Seems like there are always kids out there. Um, also, replacement for the Best Year Center, we developed the, uh, what is now called the Lakeside Center here, again, to augment this development here. And then again, partnered with our, uh, our friends at Rotary to develop the Rotary Playground, which, of course, is, uh, is uh, also, I think, occupied 24-7. So that brings us again to this point. 2020 to 2035. This slide shows you on the left is the 2008 plan. Again, the building we're sitting in now. And what we're now going to talk about now, which is the Beaumont Vision 2035 plan. So now we'll get into the Beaumont Vision 2035 plan. Again, what we're talking about is bold vision bold action to try to redevelop downtown Beaumont. 
This is the plan, and what you see here, and it's obviously you can't read it from where you're sitting, it's a very small print, but we do have print, uh, prints out of it here. And again, as Demi, Demi mentioned, after the presentation's up here, we're gonna have breakout sessions where you can look at the plan specifically and ask and answer questions. Um, but let me walk you through some of the highlights of the elements of this plan. But let me orient you, again, on the left, down to the bottom left, is approximately Crockett and Natchez, where we're sitting now, what we refer to as the Lake District. Top right is the Riverfront Natchez District. Again, 2008, bold vision and planning. Going back here, 1970s era, bold vision and planning. And so what this idea is here is to connect the two, again, with water. And again, the key is water. What attracts people here I think, to a large degree, is the lake. What attracts people, nature's river, and again, you've all been to cities across the country, it's the water that people really uh, are attracted to. So again, once we get Riverfront Park reopened, we get some of these elements developed, you're gonna have the nature's river water connected with this waterway, connected with the lake district. So let's jump into the plan. But before I do that, I'm going to show a video of the plan. Located along the Neches River, downtown Beaumont is home to both astonishing biodiversity and a Texas-sized historical significance. At the heart of the Golden Triangle, Beaumont is in the midst of billions of dollars of new energy investment. The Beaumont Downtown Plan capitalizes on the lure of existing attractions and an outstanding quality of life. The plan fosters economic development to reposition Beaumont as the region's premier destination for residents and visitors alike. A continuous, attraction-rich waterway promenade connects the Lake District to Beaumont's waterfront. A series of green spaces punctuate the waterway with shaded oasis for dining, boating, and other leisure activities. Existing buildings along the waterway are repurposed to preserve the city's rich architectural heritage, placemaking underpins and catalyzes investment for the economic development of downtown Beaumont. Public art expresses Beaumont's history and leadership in the humanities. Native planting recalls the wonder and beauty of Beaumont's natural environment. The waterway features a quarter mile long canal traveling four blocks from Neches Street to Main Street. The canal varies in width from 20 to 40 feet, creating multi-level activity spaces. The canal will feature 3,500 feet of new promenade, more than half a mile of shaded, walkable delight. Renovated historic structures will be repurposed along with new building into an exciting mixed-use development. The same spirit of innovation which built Beaumont guides the downtown plan, harnessing historical legacy with contemporary ideas to foster a thriving city. Old, right? So again, I'm just going to highlight some of the main elements of the Vision 2035 plan. Again, 3,500 feet of water promenade. promenade. Um, again, as you saw the video, you'll, you see it was a mixture of buildings that exist now, like Crockett Street, like Edison Tower, 
Um, but then you also saw, of course, infill buildings. And that's where, again, our partnership with the private sector is going to be key. The, the city, you know, we, our job is to really, uh, again, focus on the infrastructure, the waterway itself, et cetera. Um, perhaps public-private partnerships in some elements. Um, but really, a lot of it is going to be uh, the private sector. And so you'll see, you know, in this, we're talking about, of course, you know, the walkway, restaurants, uh, shopping, uh, but also resident, residences. So I think a lot of what our downtown is missing um, is people living here 24-7. We know we come here late at night. Um, it is not dangerous, despite what some people think. Um, it is uh, actually one of the safer areas in the city. And so uh, that perception it still kind of hangs over us, but in terms of safety, it is safe. And so again, residential people living here 24-7, again, that's one of the key features uh, that we feel like we need downtown. So the idea is private sector, hopefully, building along this waterway. Uh, again, I'll stretch from Natchez, which is right out here behind the lake, all the way to Maine, which will intersect with the rest of the park, again, on to Natchez River. Again, these are just some stills that are from the video. Uh, but again, you can see there's some existing buildings that are within the frame, uh, but also some proposed buildings. And again, this is a 2035 plan, so you know, we're looking at uh, you know a decade uh, to try to get uh, try to get to this point. And here you can see a frame of uh, this is uh, would be a block that's that's right in front of Crockett Street right leading into Edison Tower. And leading into another element, um, which is a hotel nature. And I know uh, there's been talk and consideration of a hotel on our riverfront for many, many years. And I think the reason that idea has persisted for many, many years is because it's a good idea. I think um, we all know if we had a full service hotel located on the riverfront, uh, it would be uh, the preeminent hotel in our region. So again, this is the area uh, highlighted in red where the hotel would be located. And uh, Christina Loki is going to speak a little bit more about the hotel project in the next section. Uh, but these are just some renderings of what that might look like. Uh, again, a full service hotel on Main Street overlooking the river. So you imagine Again, ballroom, meeting room, uh, swimming pool overlooking the river, and of course the rooms on that side look, overlooking the river. Also, ideally, we'd have a, a glass atrium that would link the hotel to the adjacent Civic Center Convention Center. So it might be a space, a smaller version of this space, but overlooking the river. Which takes us to the next element, which is the conversion of the Civic Center to a convention center. We think that's a key element to try to bring uh, more meetings down to Beaumont to utilize the new hotel. And then finally, I mentioned earlier re residential, um, highlighted in red here. Um, again, you can imagine whether for rent or condominiums, if you had residential overlooking the Natures River, I think it would be a very, very popular option. Um, but again, uh, having people live downtown for 24 hours a day, seven days a week is a key missing element. And then finally, kind of linking all of that together, outlined in red, is an expansion of Riverfront Park. And so again, these are clips from the video where you see a green space, the riverway in the back, the hotel in the back, the residential in the back. And then here might be an amphitheater where you might have concerts on a night like this with Nature's River in the background. Um, and it really becomes a destination, a focal point uh, for the whole region. Uh, but again, tying all this in. Also an element of a walkway up over the railroad tracks. Uh, again, a real destination, a reason for folks to come down. And then this, I show this graph because it's, it's actually in this year's budget CIP for design this year. This is a food truck park. And that's one of our plans is to uh, do a food truck park 
down on or near the river, again, as, as kind of an extension of this concept. And this you know, should be happening you know, within the next couple of years. Again, design this year, construction next year. So. And again, these are the vision elements. Um, how do we get there? I keep mentioning bold vision and execution. Uh, that's, that's really the key. So if you look back at the Nature's River projects back in the 1970s and 80s, the project here, um, I don't want to touch on too many of these elements because uh, June Ellis, our other assistant city manager, is going to talk about you know, how do we pay for some of these things. But you start to see like the food truck part that's already worked its way into the CIP. Um, the expansion of the riverfront park is in the CIP for further down the road. Um, but we're going to have to look at all options. So bond elections, uh, and again, I don't want to steal the thunder of uh, Mr. Ellis, but how to pay for these elements you know, is going to be key. And with that, I will turn it over to Barbara Kodiak, Director of Public Works. Thank you. Good evening. So back in 2017, Harvey came through and paid us a visit and took out our front park, unfortunately. Uh, we worked with FEMA for funding to bring it back. The awarded project cost of that is a little over $20 million to restore uh, Riverfront Park as the boundaries existed after Harvey. Project started March 6, 2023. We expect to be completed with the park by the end of this year. The project includes new sheep pile wall along the river, concrete dock, drainage, uh, sidewalks with handrails along the river, repaired pavilions, lighting throughout the park, park benches, picnic tables, and uh, drinking water fountains. So that's a kind of a small picture of where we're at uh, currently. I think this was last week. They're pouring the, the dock along the river. You can see it's quite a bit bigger than it was with the previous rendition of the park. Redid the uh, pavilion roofs. And we hope to be finished by the end of 2024. I will turn it over to Mr. Ellis, our assistant city manager. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. My name is June Ellis, assistant city manager with the city of Beaumont. Today I will be covering the city's tax increment reinvestment zone, also known as the city's TERS. I will uh, talk to you about the creation of that TERS, the, uh, the goal of the reinvestment zone or the TERS, and I will also cover um, items in the city's five-year CIP, which is the Community Investment Plan. So the tax increment reinvestment zone these are zones that are special, specially created by uh, the uh, Texas Tax Code. Chapter 311 of the Texas Tax Code allows cities to create uh, tourist zones within their communities. Uh, and they're also approved by the City Council for creation uh, to attract new investments, uh, new investment to an area. Uh, the Beaumont City Council created the downtown tours uh, on December 12th of 2023. It has been 21 years since the city of Beaumont uh, had a tours. That tours expired in the year 2003. It was a much smaller tours than our tax increment reinvestment zone. Uh, so we decided that in order to create uh, value and boost economic development that we needed to create a a new terms in the city, and I'll discuss more of, of that uh, creation. It is a widely used economic development tool uh, that allocates revenues for public improvements. There are over 400 terms zones throughout the state of Texas. Uh, most, if not all, of those terms zones are really affected. Uh, it's a dedicated financing mechanism for specifically economic development in a community. It pays for public improvements over a long period of time while incentivizing private investment. And 
that's one of the keys and one of the benefits of having a tax increment reinvestment zone is that and you can you can pair those dollars, those public dollars, with a private investment from a private develop, developer to redevelop a property or develop new properties. So the project revenues, uh, they actually come from the growth of new development within a defined area uh, created by the TERS zone. And again, this is, they're created uh, to blast really for a long period of time because development really does take time uh, and our terrorist zone that we created here at City of Bovine is a 30-year terrorist and I'll show you a little bit more on the next slide about how a terrorist actually worked. Uh, one good thing and many good things about the terrorist actually but one good thing is that it does not require the city to issue any debt. There is no change in the tax rate, so it doesn't affect your tax rate that you pay annually. There is no negative impact to the taxpayer. Um, so we call it a pay-as-you-go tax increment reinvestment zone, which essentially means that the money that comes in is only what we pay out. So as money is deposited into the terrorist fund over the next 30 years, uh, then those dollars are used to create economic development within within our community. So the city actually starts collecting revenue. This church was created uh, in, in December of last year. The city will start cre collecting uh, church revenue later this month. The um, Jefferson appraisal Central Appraisal District will start issuing tax notices in the middle of October, so in a couple of weeks. Uh, some property owners begin paying their property taxes early, then waiting until the due date, which is January 31st. So therefore, the city will start depositing TERS dollars uh, for the first year of 30 years later this month. The county and the drainage district, they could participate uh, in uh, the city's TERS, uh, they are taxing entities as well, uh, and if they participate in the tax increment reinvestment zone, it, it will only generate more revenue and faster uh, to the TERS fund. So the way a TERS zone works is uh, that it actually starts with the base year value of all properties within the TERS. And a couple of slides uh, over uh, Next couple of slides, I will show you the actual tourist zone, but it starts with the base year, the value in that base year on all properties within the tour. So as of January 1st, 2023, whatever the appraisal district appraised those properties in the tours at is the base value which continues throughout the life of the tours. What I mean by continues is that the city will continue to receive 100% of the taxes on that base value. But the benefit of the TERS is that middle section, that polygon section there at the top, which is really the increment. Year after year, as the value of, of those properties increase, then the city will begin to uh, receive a portion of those dollars that will go into a TERS fund. So that top portion there, that brownish color or orange color, that is the money that would go into the TERS fund. So the city decided that we will participate in the TERS at 60%. So 60% of revenues collected on the increase in the value of properties within the TERS will be deposited into a TERS fund. And the remaining 40% will be deposited into the city's general. And the city's general fund is what pays for police and fire and EMS and parks and recreation, finance. Um, so the lifespan of the church, as I mentioned, is 30 years. And at the end of the 30 years, which is year 2053, all of the revenue then goes back to the city's general fund. So that's essentially is how a church works. So here are a couple of examples of, uh, of, a, of a TERS. Property A on January 1st, 2023, let's assume it's 
valued at a million dollars. The appraised value the following year, January 1st, 2024, it goes up 3%, making the property valued at $1,030,000. So that new tax increment that goes into the tourist fund uh, is the taxes collected on that $30,000 worth of increase in value. Or let's assume property A is vacant and it's valued at $100,000. And it's improved the next year with improvements valued at a million dollars, making the property valued at $1.1 million. So the new tax increment that goes into the TERS at 60%, because the city is participating at 60%, uh, will be based on that $1 million increase in value. So the base value stays the same and continues to be collected into the general fund. We're only collecting TERS dollars on the increment, the increase over the base value. So this is a map of the boundary created uh, by the city for its tax increment reinvestment zone. This is considered a very large TERS zone. As you can see, it extends all the way north up to East Tex, west down Highway 105 to Major Drive. On the west side, Highway 190, or Highway 90, it extends out to the city limit. To the south, it extends all the way to Ford Park. Uh, southeast, it extends all the way down US 69 to the city limits, and it covers part of the city's ETJ, extraterritorial extra jurisdiction, and it covers the in, entirety of downtown. So we had to create a large TERS uh, because we, we looked at the projects that the TERS contemplates accomplishing. Uh, and in order for us to be able to move the dial on these projects, the TERS had to be created as, as large as it currently is. Uh, we want to generate revenue fast so that we can use those dollars to reinvest in downtown and other parts of Beaumont. So we have a big agenda. This, this TERS uh, project is, uh, you'll see on a couple of slides over, there's a lot, there's a lot of money. There's a lot of major projects that we plan uh, to accomplish over the, the coming years. And that's why we needed a very large terrorist zone. And what we also did was we uh, consulted with an expert uh, to help us determine whether or not, before we even started, whether or not a terrorist even makes sense for the city of Beaumont. So an analysis was done, a feasibility analysis, and uh, the answer was yes. A, a terrorist zone would benefit BOMA. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we will participate at 60%. Uh, and over 30 years, based on the analysis, new development values are projected to increase. And this is just new development values are projected to increase by 1.6%. $1.36 billion. That would produce revenues to the city over this 30 year time frame of almost $78 million uh, for the, into the tourist fund for development downtown specifically and in some other parts of the community. And the general fund would receive almost $52 million. If the, if the county participated, uh, they would generate $40.9 million into the tourist fund. They would receive in their general fund $27.3 million. And the drainage district, another taxing entity, if they participated, that's an additional $21.9 million into the tourist fund. And they would retain $14.6 million. So that's a grand total of $140.6 million. So that would allow us to receive revenue faster to more participants uh, within this tourist zone to be able to use those dollars to uh, uh, pump back into projects and development uh, within downtown. So in total, uh, the tourist fund, that all three entities participated over 30 years would generate $140.6 million. And the entities would retain $93.7 million. So the thought before we even considered the creation of this TERS zone was that if we do nothing, 
we would expect for things to just stay the way they are or decline. So we wanted to do something to create new opportunities to invest in downtown. And we knew that this tourist zone was a key mechanism to doing it. Again, it creates dollars for projects within the zone, and particularly for this tourist zone, it creates projects and dollars for projects downtown. So in order to create a tourist zone, there were many steps that we had to go through, and the city council ultimately uh, had to approve a project plan when they approved the creation of the tourist zone. So these are projects that are within the project plan approved by city council. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but uh, if you go down four rows, the Main Street Riverfront Park Extension Project, uh, that's anticipated at the former site of the AT&T building. Uh, we estimate that from these tourist dollars, we could use about $8.8 .8 million to redevelop that site. And that site could be a uh, Greenway Plaza, could have various amenities to attract uh, locals and, and visitors to the site. It could be a family-friendly area. Uh, amenities could include a bandstand or a river theater, water fountain, splash pad, uh, decorative lighting, those types of items we anticipate for, for that location uh, downtown. The next one down is, is the Civic Center improvements. That is actually the dollars uh, we estimate to use from tourist funds uh, to convert the uh, Civic Center into a convention center. Uh, we anticipate improving uh, the aesthetics on the interior of the Civic Center, uh, include meeting rooms uh, inside, and also modernize the Civic Center uh, itself. We expect that cost to be about $15 million. The next one down is, is the downtown revitalization program and facade renovation. We plan to use about six, $6 million for a downtown re, uh, revitalization program and a facade grant uh, program as well, where downtown business owners can apply for grant funds to help improve uh, the exterior of their buildings downtown. The one highlighted in yellow is a drainage district six project and when I started working on this I reached out to uh, the drainage district and this was one of their projects that they recommended to the city, uh, Corley Diversion Project at 15 million dollars and just last week they did inform the city that they got a, an addition to their grant uh, to offset the cost of this $15 million that they were expecting from the use of these TERS funds. So, therefore, uh, we're going to eventually remove this project, and if the drainage district uh, uh, wishes to participate in the uh, TERS zone, and we hope so, uh, we will reach out to them for additional projects to add to fund from these TERS dollars. There are some street a road rehab projects that we have in the plan. And the second from the bottom is the transmission distribution line relocation. Those uh, are the lines, energy, energy lines that uh, crisscross or bisect the uh, Civic Center parking lot. So we anticipate, we really, we're really hopeful that we will get a full service hotel downtown and possibly in that area. So those distribution line will need to be rerouted down Main Street, uh, Pine Street, uh, possibly even Tevis, so that we can construct a hotel in that area. And the last one is really the most expensive one. Obviously, it's the downtown waterway feature that's part of the downtown plan. Uh, this estimate is from 2023, last year. It didn't include an escalation factor, so uh, obviously we know the cost rise and uh, we expect for that number to be higher than what it was last year but that was the number that we received last year for this particular project. Uh, we could use TERS dollars, we would hope to uh, 
uh, partner with uh, the private industry and others to uh, help offset uh, the cost of, of uh, that project and, and other projects. And that particular project, you saw it on the map uh, shortly ago, that it would connect the, uh, this district, the Lake District, uh, to the river. That's the idea behind uh, the, the project. So this is my last slide, and I just want to quickly cover some of the elements uh, in Vision 2035 and the city's CIP, Community Investment Plan, and what our next steps are. We have to consider a, a way to finance these projects, and there are uh, multiple ways that, that we can get these projects funded. Uh, Mr. Barkoviak uh, talked about the uh, Riverfront Park restoration. That's mainly grant funded. That should be completed within the next couple of months. To the right of that is the Riverfront Park Extension Project. Again, that would be the gateway en entrance to, into the Riverfront Park. Uh, we have that project in our community investment plan for our fiscal year, which begins October 1st, which began yesterday. Uh, that project is slated for fiscal year 2026 20, through 27, and it's also listed in the Vision 2035 plan. The Civic Center conver Conversion, which is a project that I've discussed, we have that listed in our Community Investment Plan for fiscal year 2027 through 2028, and it's also anticipated to be funded with TERS funds. A new City Hall, it's listed in the Vision 2035 plan, but our five-year, our Community Investment Plan is a five-year plan. But we have one column in that plan that is a future year column uh, for projects we know we would like to have created, but um, we just didn't want to at the time include that project or those projects within the five year window. So a new city hall we're estimating would be uh, built in the year 2030 or later. Our five year plan, CIP plan, starts at fiscal year 2025. We're currently in fiscal year 2025 and extends to 2029. So that's the five years. So the new city hall is outside of that five-year window. Uh, again, the city looks at and reviews the five-year CIP annually. So we can move projects, and we normally do, up or down, uh, or we can move them forward or, or move them back each year depending on um, the need of the city for some of these developments. The next one there on the left of the new police department headquarters, we have that listed as a future project, uh, fiscal year 2030 or later. Uh, we don't have a location identified for that project. It could be downtown or it could be in an area outside of downtown. The Hotel Atrium project, uh, Ms. Loki will uh, talk about that project. It's in our Vision 2035 plan, and we hope that project will be funded uh, through a public-private partnership. The Riverwalk Waterway project, I discussed that one as well. We hope to fund that one with TERS funds. Food Truck Park, uh, that's in our CIP slated to begin design this fiscal year with construction scheduled for next fiscal year. Parking garages, if we build a new hotel downtown, uh, we're gonna, and, and other amenities, we are going to need places for uh, people to park. So we have a couple of park, uh, parking garages uh, in the Vision 2035 plan uh, that would need funding as well. So what are some of the funding mechanisms for projects for these key projects. As I talked about, we could use tax increment reinvestment zone funds, the tourist funds. We could issue debt. Uh, these are general obligation bonds or certificates of obligation. We would seek federal and state grant funding. Uh, we would also seek funding from foundations uh, and other donations from uh, the community. We would partner with the private industry and have public-private uh, partnerships. Some of these projects, especially the uh, waterway feature, a lot of the buildings along uh, that route would 
wouldn't be owned by the city, they would be privately owned. Uh, and then city operations. Uh, we could, if the funding is available, use city dollars from our fund balance, if we have a sufficient fund balance to help offset some of the costs of these projects. And also House Bill 5012. During the state's 88th legislative session, uh, the state voted on a bill uh, that was uh, eventually sent to the governor. Uh, the governor signed the bill and it became effective uh, September 1st. This bill allows uh, the city, once the hotel was built, to uh, recapture the hotel tax dollars that would normally go to the state when someone books a hotel room and pays for a hotel room. So for a total of 10 years, the state has already granted us approval to rebate their portion of the hotel occupancy tax dollars that they would receive. So that could help the city offset certain costs for the construction of the convention center and possibly uh, the construction of the hotel. So uh, that's the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, I'm sure there are some questions from some of you. Uh, I will be sitting at the Vision 2035 table after we complete all of these presentations. So feel free to come over and uh, talk to me about uh, the TERS or how we plan to finance these projects. Thank you. I promise it's going to go a lot quicker from here because it's really important we get to hear from you. That's the exciting part. Um, so I'm here today to talk to everyone about the request for a proposal. Um, this actually was administered August the f uh, 1st um, and the deadline was September 26th. So just to show you a guidelines, the project scope of the area in which the hotel um, developers were able to utilize is 8.25 acres that attaches to the Civic Center and the Civic Center parking lot, including the area of 555 that's actually been demolished and looks amazing. Look at all that riverfront property. Uh, we are so excited because we asked for a full service hotel with a minimum of 175 guest rooms and a minimum of 14,000 square feet of ballroom and meeting space. It's so important for us to understand not just the importance of hot tax and being able to utilize an additional hotel, but more importantly for our Convention and Visitors Bureau to be able to sell the hotel and bring in meetings and conventions and more money to the area. Um, We've showcased the 8.25 acres. We've asked for food and beverage with a three meal restaurant, club lounge, um, including outdoor patio and potentially rooftop space. As far as incentives go, we've showcased the tax incremental reinvestment zone, the TERS that you just heard funding from. Uh, we have chapter 380 agreements, site preparation, the new convention center. So please understand that by converting the Civic Center into a convention center, we are actually eligible to receive the hot tax that would go out to the state will come back to our city. So that's a huge amount of investment that's gonna be coming back to Beaumont by just turning the Civic Center into a convention center. And again, that is gonna be used with TERS funding. Um, and then finally, we have city and possible county tax property tax abatements, um, including the HB 5012 that includes the taxes. So just to showcase the timeline, we issued the RFP on August the 1st. Um, the deadline was September 26th. We're excited to announce that we did in fact have multiple proposals that were submitted. So now we will do the interview and selection process that will go through October, and then we will begin negotiations of definitive agreements in November. So stay tuned for some really exciting stuff because a hotel downtown is what many of us know downtown truly needs. And here we have Bo Hansen with the WD Building Official. All right, well, in the background of everything we've heard this evening, uh, Building Codes is working with property owners to address many of the unsafe structures uh, around downtown. Uh, tonight I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what that process has been uh, like and where we are today. So, we began with a three-phase approach to inspect every building within a particular grid. 
this was essentially a college to Calder and as wide as Maine to Natchez, so about a four block wide grid. Uh, again, college to Calder. Uh, you can see a map of this over uh, where we're going to be after this. Myself and Boyd Meyer, the chief building official, uh, we've got all the properties laid out in that grid, and you can see where all those buildings stand. Um, but on August 6, we gave our first presentation to council, and at that time, which you can see right here on this pie chart, we had 17 signed up for the work program. And the work program, in case you're unfamiliar with that, is where the owner is responsive, they're communicating with us, our office, and committed to making repairs in an agreed upon time. Five of these were non-responsive, but to be fair, uh, at that time they still had a specific amount of time before we would take further action. Three were filed in court, which means uh, their time had run out and we took sub subsequent steps, and two had been repaired enti entirely. Uh, meaning the unsafe violations had been resolved. So not the entire building, but the unsafe violations that we originally tagged for. And a quick note, uh, several of our buildings downtown are boarded and secured. When owners choose to board and secure broken windows, the code only allows for this temporary repair to last one year. So for some of these buildings, we were simply formally starting the shot clock on those buildings. On this slide, um, you'll see where we are today in contrast to where we were on August 6th. Uh, one color that has gone away is purple, meaning one way or another, each building is now moved into new categories. Uh, most notably, five actual construction permits have been pulled downtown, um, identified in light blue there on the right-hand side. Um, and just this morning, I got a call from a contractor stating that they are actually close to being ready for reinspection on one of those permits. So again, we're seeing small steps of progress. I know it feels slow, but this is the progress that we want to see when permits are being pulled. And then I'll quickly point out, we have uh, more that we are filing on in court, and two more have been repaired entirely, entirely bringing that total to four. Um, essentially, we want to see less work programs and filings in court and more permits pulled, ultimately resulting in um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Demi Ingman, but I'm grateful for the opportunity here with you this evening. If y'all want to talk to myself or uh, our building official, Mr. Meyer, we will be over there. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm going to touch quickly on the uh, recently passed uh, vacant building registry that passed on September 3rd by City Council. So the purpose of the vacant building registry is, is to support revitalization in Beaumont's nationally recognized downtown historic commercial district. Over the past years, we've seen some considerable dis disinvestment and vacancy to these structures. Um, and due to it, unfortunately, many of the Beaumont uh, historic buildings have become abandoned and also fallen into disrepair. Uh, so in order to breathe new life into the downtown area, we we researched and passed an ordinance that would encourage property owners to make a much needed repair to those buildings. In doing so, the goal is to encourage establishment of new businesses, create vibrancy downtown, um, by, in all, by encouraging property owners to take responsibility for the vacant properties. The intent is uh, for business owners to find suitable locations in which to ex establish or expand their businesses and feel confident to invest in downtown Beaumont. On the screen, the area outlined in red is the area that is applicable to the uh, vacant building registry ordinance. Uh, this is all of the properties that are within the central business district. Uh, we were actually contacted by uh, property owners fronting Calder Avenue, um, and they would like to actually become um, or be involved in the vacant building registry. Uh, so that, that area uh, is not adopted, it's just proposed. Um, it may be considered at a council meeting later in October, uh, but that area would extend from lots fronting Calder from Main Street all the way down to 11th Street. Um, I do, whenever we break out, you guys can see a uh, map over there to, to show that proposed area. So the requirements of the vacant building registry, uh, number one, uh, designate a property manager if the owner does not reside within the city limits. Number two, disclose how you intend to monitor your property on a weekly basis. Three, submit a six-month plan to secure, restore, repair, repurpose, and occupy the building. Number four, disclose a plan for regular maintenance of the property and premises. Number five, 
Submit a floor plan for first responders to use during catastrophic events or calls for service. Number six, file a cr criminal trespass affidavit with the Beaumont Police and post on the structure. And last, uh, you must add security measures at minimum. You must install exterior lighting to the building and premises, install a security camera system, or employ security patrols during the night hours, and install burglar and fire alarms. So on this slide, uh, applicability, um, the registry will not apply to properties who have a valid building permit on file with the city and are demonstrating progress as it relates to the scope of work disclosed within that permit. And of course, the registry would not apply to occupied buildings. The council approved the fees, as you see on the screen, which cover the annual registration and required multi-departmental inspections. These fees are to offset costs associated with the vacant building structures, such as response to catastrophic events, uh, such as fires, calls for service, inspections, blight mitigation, and enforcement. The ordinance has measures of enforcement built into it. It will be the property owner's responsibility to ensure their structures are compliant with all city adopted codes, ordinances, state laws, and federal regulations. And lastly, uh, the point of, of contact, our city's gaming and permitted manager uh, located within the Planning and Community Development Department, located at City Hall, will administer the vacant building registry program. I've placed her contact information on the screen should anyone need assistance through registration, questions, comments, or concerns. I definitely encourage citizens to reach out to 311 if they want to report any vacant structures. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to thank y'all and introduce uh, Christina Loki. She's already been up here, but she's our city's newly appointed uh, economic development manager. Okay, I don't know if you heard that, but that's economic development. So the city of Beaumont is investing in economic development for the first time in over 25 years. And that's a huge thing to this administration. And it's really important for everyone to understand what this means for Beaumont. So let's just talk specifically for downtown priorities. We've actually already updated our Chapter 312 policy, and we're working on updating our neighborhood empowerment zones and the Chapter 380 policy. We issued our hotel RFP, we've already received multiple proposals, and now we're gonna start working on strategic partnerships. And these are public-private partnerships that's gonna make this Vision 2035 come to life. So neighborhood empowerment zones. Many people don't actually realize the city of Beaumont has already offered incentives for the area. There's six zones that are highlighted within Beaumont, and these incentives include lien waivers, property tax abatements, including permit fee waves and expedited permitting fees. So let's talk about NES zone number five. NES zone number five is actually the entirety of downtown. And what's so important about this is that you have to understand that tax abatements for three years come with a minimum investment of just $50,000 in a residential or $75,000 commercial. And in the grand scheme, that's really truly not a lot of money. Um, I keep putting QR codes because there is additional information and obviously this recording is going to be available online through Facebook as well as the YouTube channel for the City of Beaumont and you'll be able to speak to us afterwards that it has QR codes to get you to the sites as well. Finally, Texas, so we don't just have actual local incentives, we also have state and federal incentives. So please understand that the outline that you're seeing here is a Texas Enterprise Funds. So these are outlined for state funding, and then even better, federal opportunity zones. So we actually have two federal opportunity zones within the city of Beaumont, and the entirety of downtown is included in one of those, which means we're actually eligible for any investments that come downtown for federal funding. Finally, I think that what's really important about everything you've heard today is just how all the pieces come together. And you have to see how the vacant building registry, including the building standards and all the code suite that code enforcement is doing, as well as zoning updates to allow for different CBDs to be classified without specific use permits, is gonna all allow for more development downtown. And then there's gonna be incentives, which is what we're talking about. So all of these pieces showcase the city of Beaumont taking a proactive approach to allow not only for development downtown, but for us to ensure the Vision 2035 goal and to be able to draw more people to help us in this vision.
Why here, why now? If you'd like to scan, you'll be able to see not just tax incentives, but the one-stop permitting shop. And our permitting team and our planning and zoning, they're out there doing things. And we actually have offered pre-development meetings that are free. So you're able to come in and sit with everyone from fire to water to engineering. You'll sit with everyone for free and be able to discuss whatever business you're bringing to Beaumont and what those plans look like. And we'll be able to administer all of the help that you need to allow for easeability to open your business. Um, finally, here's all of our contact information. I'd like to strongly suggest you reach out any point in time because now's the time to develop Beaumont and every single one of us needs to play a role in being able to showcase this incredible vision and helping us lead us to it. Finally, here are the breakouts because we really want to hear from you. So what we've done is we've allowed for the green section. The very first section will be Demi as well as Lindsay with the vacant building registry. Just a little bit further behind will be Code Sweep. Finally, June as well as Chris will be in the very far, far back for Vision 2035. And then myself and Delaney will be dressed right near my guests and we'll be at the first tables right here. We would love to be able to hear your participation and to see a little bit more about what your thoughts are in not just the Vision 2035 plan, but everything that you've heard today that works together for the proactive approach to bring downtown back to life. Great. Well, I thank you all so much for your time and let's break out and really talk about it.